two outsiders, two conventional candidates and two parties. It's a system that today's guest has described as gravely ill. On this edition of the Newsmakers, I'll be joined by the US Green Party presidential candidate, Jill Stein. She promises to fix America's broken political system. Also on today's programme, Brexit and bust, we ask if the Eurozone could be the real victim if Britain exits Europe. And in picture this, staying up all night, protests against labour law changes gather pace across France. Hello and welcome to the Newsmakers with me, Matthew Moore. When the United States votes for a new president this year, there will, as usual, be a candidate from each of the two biggest parties, and one of them will win. While the US is not officially a two-party system, you have to go back a century and a half to find a president from another party. But as the parties choose their nominees, the divisions appear deeper than usual. This election season has seen the rise of the outsider. In Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, both parties have a candidate who appear to act as an antidote to the American centre. But is the US political system ready for something different from the status quo? In just a moment, I'll be joined by Jill Stein, a US presidential candidate who says that American democracy is on life support. But first, today's newsmaker is the two-party system as we ask if it's failing Americans. <laughs> The Republicans and the Democrats, the two parties have long dominated US politics. While it's not technically impossible for other parties to make it into the White House, in reality, the infrastructure and funding needed make America's political system a two-horse race. But this year's presidential hopefuls are appealing to the fringes rather than the party faithful. Republican frontrunner Donald Trump the Washington outsider is appealing to a new kind of Republican voter. We're tired of but many see him as divisive, and he has the Republican old guard closing ranks on him. At what point do we say enough is enough? He is a disaster. Donald Trump will be an embarrassment to America. His imagination must not be married to real power. The status quo is also being challenged on the other end of the spectrum. Bernie Sanders, a democratic socialist, he is anti-Wall Street, anti-lobbyists, and anti the Washington establishment. He stood as an independent in the US Senate, but is campaigning on the Democratic ticket. He has been scathing of the Democrats in the past, but in a two-party system, the Democrats were perhaps his most viable option. Polarisation has become a defining feature of the US political landscape. Once both placed close to the centre, the Republicans and Democrats are now both less diverse and further apart than at any point in the last two decades. Bitter animosity along party lines has risen, creating stumbling blocks to reform in Congress. And as politicians have become polarised and pitted against each other, so too has the American society. With the share of Republicans who dislike Democrats jumping from 17% to 43% in the last 20 years, Likewise, Democrats with negative opinions about Republicans has more than doubled from 16% to 38%. And the vast majority see the policies of the opposing party as a threat to the nation's well-being. With this political structure set in stone, some in the US are asking whether it's time to bring more diversity and options to the mainstream. But could the U.S. move away from its two-party tradition? Simply for any of the other parties that exist in the United States, they just simply don't have the money, the infrastructure, and the national notoriety to put a candidate up who is competitive. Any change to a new political dynamic would require reform to level the playing field. If you're a member of the Democratic or the Republican Party, you don't want to give away any of your power. You don't want to give uh, an advantage to somebody else who might come in and uh, make you less relevant. And the change candidates like Trump and Sanders threaten to bring is also at risk of being stamped out. Both parties have superdelegates or rules in place so that undesirable candidates can essentially be vetoed by the party elite. Republicans and Democrats seem unlikely to loosen the firm grip they have on US politics. And for some, that's all the more reason why a change is needed. Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers.
Joining me now from Boston is the US presidential candidate Jill Stein from the Green Party. She believes that parties like her own are the key to reforming America's political system and democracy. Jill Stein, thank you very much for joining us on The Newsmakers. I just want to start with one point. You're the Great most successful you. woman to ever run for the presidency, but you won less than 1% of the vote in 2012. Would you agree you have no chance this year? I think my chance is like that of the average American, to tell you the truth, who's really up against uh, very steep odds for a job, for a decent wage, for a health care, for a young person to get out of debt. We have an entire generation which is locked into basically unpayable predatory debt. So I'd say I'm in very good company in having a very difficult time working with the system but, as but it exists. Jill, what do you Paul put it down to? Do you think there are systemic obstacles to you doing well in this year's election? There certainly are systemic obstacles, but, you know, when people ask me, are you going to win, I say, I'm not holding my breath, but I'm not ruling it out. I think the very important thing is that we build this vast social movement, which is quite powerful right now. In fact, half of Americans have already divorced the Democratic and Republican parties. There's majority disapproval, actually, for both of the parties right now. Well, let me pick you so, up on that, Jill. Uh, uh, you know, let me pick you up on that. The Republicans have 30 million... Uh, members. The Democrats have 43 million. Your party has a quarter of a million. So if you look at it, it seems that the Republicans and Democrats do enjoy gr much far, far greater support than your party. Another way to look at it, though, is that 50% uh, of Americans do not identify with either Democrats or Republicans. According to the Wall Street Journal poll, it's 21% of the entire electorate that actually supports Republicans, 29% that identifies as Democrats. The reason we do uh, poorly in polls is because people don't know we exist. We are systematically blocked out of media coverage and the debates. But increasingly, people are getting their news and their information from social media, from websites and so on, in the same way that the two energized campaigns now within the Democrats and Republicans are both outsiders. Approximately 60 percent are clamoring for a new independent third party. That's so the question is, when is that house of cards going to fall down? It's R going to. And the further we get, the closer we are to that breakthrough. You make a very interesting point there about the uh, two outsiders, uh, outsiders, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. When you see those two men who are you could almost say polar opposites, really, doing very well. What does that tell you about America today? It tells you that America is in revolt. And what those two groups have in common is that they've both been thrown under the bus economically. Uh, the Sanders supporters are younger, uh, more socially liberal. The Trump supporters are older and more socially conservative. But they share very similar views about the economy, about trade, to some extent about our foreign policy as well. So this is a movement that's really looking for a political base because the establishment parties are essentially at war with the agendas of both the Trump and the Sanders campaign. Let's take the a Green quick look. Party offers a place. Yeah, let's Go take ahead. a quick look at Bernie Sanders then. I imagine you and uh, Mr. Sanders have quite a lot in common in, term of, in terms of values. If you see that he has become the Democrat nominee, would you pull out of the race in order to avoid the risk of splitting the vote to give him the maximum chance against the Republicans? Well, let me say, first of all, the Democrats are not going to allow him to become the nominee. They have what we call a kill switch, that's superdelegates and Super Tuesdays and smear campaigns, like the way they took down Howard Dean uh, with the Dean scream. You may recall all yes. that public relations campaign. So uh, it's extremely unlikely, it's vanishingly unlikely that he will get that uh, nomination. At the same time, we've been putting out uh, an effort to dialogue with the Sanders campaign for quite some time. But fundamentally, uh, I think that uh, 
uh, that concept of independent parties being a threat is a problem. Uh, that is the propaganda campaign that's used uh, by the powers that be to stay okay. the course. The politics of fear has basically delivered everything we were afraid of. So we say reject the lesser evil, we have to fight for the okay. greater good. But your predecessor, Ralph Nader, made things harder, most commentators would say, for Al Gore in 2000 and perhaps tipped the balance towards George Bush's victory. So what I'm asking you is, if Bernie Sanders gets the nomination, will you pull out to make sure the same thing doesn't happen again this year? So let me just say that it was the Supreme Court, not uh, not the voters. In fact, right, Al but it Gore made it, lost it made it a much, a much many closer times contest, more voters. It? No, not really. No, it was the it was the huge number of Democratic voters that went over to the other side. Nader's voters were a tiny sliver. So blaming the defection of voters uh, out of uh, Gore's campaign on Greens, who were a tiny sliver of what he lost, is really a propaganda campaign. All right, well, we'll leave it Forward there. But I need to ask you, if Bernie, if Bernie Sanders wins the nomination, parties. will you pull out to give him a better chance? Uh, I'll just say that I've been looking to dialogue with Senator Sanders. Okay. Actually, for many years, well, the Green Party has been trying to have that dialogue. Okay, let's move on to some of the most important obstacles to third parties today. Let's start with the electoral system. Many people say that the way that candidates, if they win, they take first place. Even if they don't get 50%, they take it all. Isn't that the key? You need electoral system reform to allow third parties to do anything at all. Exactly. And now those reforms are simple and easy. In the presidential race, we need a reform called ranked choice voting. It lets you rank your choices instead of just voting for one person. And it guarantees that if you vote for an underdog based on your principles and your beliefs, and that underdog loses, your vote is reassigned to your second choice. We could actually pass that right now. Uh, the states have the authority to pass that in their legislatures. So that any possibility for splitting the vote could be preempted right now. My campaign, this was when I first ran for office in 2002, running for governor against Mitt Romney. My campaign helped get that legislation filed in the Massachusetts legislature so there would be no splitting of the vote. But the Democrats rely on fear in order to keep their voters voting for them. So they will continue to do that. This is not, so the uh, this is not a reform that's going to go down easily. We're going to have to push this in every way that we can. So the Democrats and the Republicans enjoy this duopoly. They control the rules. There's really no chance of any reform for the electoral process in the near future, is there, in a word? I think we don't know. You know, I think it's hard to say there's no chance. If they see that we are truly a threat, then they may actually pass these reforms. Okay, let's, and let's I think get, that's our job. Let's get to another subject really quickly. We're running out of time, and that is funding. The federal government provides matching funds if you get over a certain threshold. But really those funds rarely go to any other party other than the Republicans and Democrats. Um, why is it so hard for third parties to get that support? Well, so let me say, we are getting some of that funding right now. We have achieved matching funds. So for every dollar we raise, we basically get a dollar from, from the federal government. But there's another threshold which is difficult to get to. But, you know, we are in a moving target right now. Life is becoming very difficult and unlivable for, dare I say, the majority of Americans. They say we're in a recovery, but in fact it's an emergency. So this is a moving target. I'd say stay tuned. Many of Bernie's supporters are looking to us to be their plan B. So so um, we could see the equation change here very soon. And just finally, Jill, uh, people are trying to understand in the United States if the Democrats and the Republicans are polarized and further apart than ever, or if, as you say, and Noam Chomsky says, and Ron Paul says, you're living essentially in a one-party state where the two overlapped so much and are the slaves of Wall Street, uh, that actually those divisions are not real, they're not substantive. It is actually just one political elite. We don't understand which one, which of those analyses is correct. Um, you know, in my view, the Democrats and Republicans share the basic 
uh, agenda uh, for an economy that's controlled by the 1%, for a foreign policy that's great for the defense contractors, but terrible for human rights, international law, and the people of America and the world. Now, the parties differ on the social issues, uh, but at the end of the day, and they have the media behind them to really crack the whip on those social issues. I think if we get to the microphone, typically we win. Uh, right. And that's why the powers that be are so frightened. So I think the name of the day here is breaking through and helping the American people understand that there really is a way forward uh, by which we can rescue our future, make it healthy, just, uh, democratic, and, um, and green for us all. Jill Stein, presidential candidate, thank you very much for joining us on the Newsmakers. So to come on Newsmakers, banking on a Brexit, what a British exit from the EU means for the Eurozone. And in picture this, the French protesters who are staying up all night to make their point. Now, as Britain prepares for a referendum in June on leaving the European Union, everyone from the Prime Minister to the London Mayor has had their say on what it would mean for the UK. Now, this week, the International Monetary Fund has warned of a severe regional consequence if Britain leaves the EU. But what will be the fallout for the rest of the Eurozone, which could lose one of its most productive economies? The newsmaker's Sandra Gatman reports. I believe that Britain will be stronger, safer and better off by remaining in a reformed European Union. Der Wunsch besteht Großbritannien als Mitglied der Europäischen Union zu erhalten. Pas des conséquences si euh, le Royaume-Uni quitte euh, l'Union européenne. I want a better deal for the people of this country to take back control. Many have weighed in on what a Brexit would mean to the European Union how it would look if a key player and economic powerhouse were to shut the door on Europe. But what will be the financial consequences for a Europe still recovering from its last financial crisis? And who would be the biggest economic winners and losers in the event of a so-called Brexit? Some fear the Eurozone could suffer the most, but in the UK, the campaign to stay paints a picture of an isolated Britain. Doomsayers predict Britain could suffer an initial economic shock, knocking as much as $140 billion from the UK economy within years. A Brexit would cut off access to the European Union's single market, forcing some companies and workers to move overseas. But some fear the effects will be felt even more across Europe. Close trading partners like Ireland and Malta could lose up to 1% of their GDP. Other EU economies doing business with the UK would take a hit too. Britain's trade with the EU is worth more than $560 billion a year. Leaving the bloc could deprive the EU of British goods and services. It also means losing the City of London, Europe's financial hub. Backers of Brexit say London's financial services will continue to thrive thanks to its global ties. But critics argue the Eurozone will be starved of its banking center and struggle to compete against other markets. A Brexit would reignite doubts about the future of the single currency after fighting to stop Greece from crashing out. And it would be a step back in the construction of the European Union as a political project, in the event other countries start looking to the exits too. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss who is set to win and lose economically from a potential Brexit, in New York is Simon Nixon, chief European commentator for the Wall Street Journal. And in Lancaster, in England, is Geraint Jonas, professor of economics at Lancaster University. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on the Newsmakers. Mr Jonas, if I could just start with you. That's the question, isn't it? Who is set to win and lose if there is a Brexit? We've already discussed uh, Britain's chances and options a great deal, but in Europe. I think Britain would certainly stand to lose. Uh, within Europe, I think we need to bear in mind that relatively few of the exports out of the European Union come to Britain. It's around 8%, whereas around 44-45% goes the other way. So the impacts within Europe, I would expect, to be a lot smaller than the impacts within Britain itself. 
that's just purely in financial terms. We'll get to the economic terms, which I know you're keen on in a moment. Simon Nixon, what's your point of view? Should Britain stay in? And uh, from the from European point of view, would Europe suffer if Britain leaves? Well, I think inevitably Europe will suffer. Uh, the, the question is just how much. Uh, the uh, uh, um, Professor Jones is right that uh, in aggregate the Eurozone only exports 8% to the UK. But some countries, as your report mentioned, such as uh, Ireland, the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, export quite a lot more to the UK. So that's one channel. But also I think it's absolutely uh, clear that if the UK does exit the EU, there will be a lot of uncertainty and volatility on the markets. And that will in turn therefore put up the cost of borrowing for companies uh, that borrow in the markets. That will, have an, that will have an economic impact too. So at the very least, there will be some economic impact. The question therefore, but the bigger question is whether there's a wider political contagion to the Eurozone that makes for a much more severe and disruptive economic impact. Okay, well, we'll get to political contagion in a moment. But are you seeing, with a couple of months to go until the referendum, any early signs on the financial markets of what investors think about this prospect? Yeah, well, we're clearly seeing some impact in the UK. And in fact, the IMF today has, has also alluded to that. We're seeing, uh, uh, we've seen sterling falling uh, against the euro. We've also seen, we're seeing uh, the, the economy slowing slightly. We, I mean, it's difficult to disentangle how much of this is a Brexit effect. There's also survey data that shows that investment decisions are being uh, held back. And clearly, as a trading partner of the Eurozone, that, that a slowing UK economy has an impact on some countries that do trade with Europe. Uh, we're not seeing at this stage, I don't think, anything that... I mean, it's, it's hard to disentangle right now anything in the European markets where you could clearly say there's a Brexit effect, and we wouldn't necessarily expect it to. OK, I just want to pick up uh, with Geraint Jonas uh, this remark from the IMF, which says... The UK exit from the EU single market is likely to reduce trade and financial flows. Why can't the United Kingdom simply replace this relationship that it currently has with some sort of bilateral trade agreement? It can replace the relationship, but I'm not sure that it can do so simply. These kinds of arrangements take many years to work through. Uh, and while we would be able to pick up something like what we left off uh, in terms of our relationships with the European Union, there are also bilateral arrangements between the European and Union and third party countries that it would be very difficult for us to make arrangements with. So Simon Nixon, a final point, the whole European project could be put in doubt to some extent. What are the major institutions in Europe able to do to put this fire out, the ECB for example, and the European leadership as a whole? Well, I think that is, that is the, the, the crucial question from a European point of view. Uh, I think what European policymakers worry about is that the market will test them. The market will want to see a political response. They will say this is a political problem that requires a political response to reassure us that the political will is still there to keep this project going. And I think that that is going to be very difficult because the ECB is already running out of room for manoeuvre. It's cut interest rates very low. It's already doing QE. It's not have it's you know it, the the costs and benefits are now starting to become very finely balanced. So the ECB on its own can't say won't be able to sort of sort this situation out. It'll have to be a political response, and and that is very very difficult. Uh, we all know what the the trade offs are between uh, more fiscal uh, pooling, more sharing of risks versus more sharing of sovereignty, and there's. It's very, it's very hard to see a way through that. Okay. So I think it, you know, that, that will be a, a, the challenge. OK, Simon Nixon, Geraint Jonas, thank you very much for joining us on The Newsmakers. Now, in today's picture this, protesters in France have been holding all-night demonstrations against changes to labour laws. And they're set to continue despite the government's offer of concessions. Let's take a look.
Now, today's newsmaker has been America's two-party system, as we asked if it's failing the US. It should provide a simple choice between two candidates for the country's 320 million citizens. But does it actually represent them? There's been an increasingly bitter fight, both within the parties and between them, as they choose their nominee. But when the winner finally takes it all, who actually wins? It's a system that's been honed over 200 years. But is America ready for an alternative to the ebb and flow of two-party politics and two-party beliefs? You've been watching this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Matthew Moore. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.